Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, the last time we met on Sunday, it was still summertime. Not so much today. So just if you want to change in the weather, wait a few minutes and it probably will. So, but it has been a little chilly today, but a beautiful day. So we're, we're always thankful to God for whatever days we get. Uh, we do want to uh, update on the announcements. Uh, again, I've put some uh, other names up there. Susan uh, Abernathy says she goes to Union Grove, known her for a long time, and she has stage four pancreatic cancer, and she's asked for the prayers of the church, so uh, please do that. Uh, put Keisha up there. Keisha is, um, they're trying to figure out what the deal is, and so she's her face is swollen, her hands are swollen, her feet are swollen, she can't really walk, she can't. And so they've taken her off the kidney medicine, trying to figure out if that's what it is, so she has to stay off of it for a week, just as they're trying to figure out what's going on. And she's she just she's sleeping all the time, so she doesn't know if it's from that medicine or she's just so tired, so she was gonna take a COVID test because uh, she said that's the last time she had COVID. That's the way she felt. She just slept all the time. So she, I told her to text me and let me know what the results were, but I haven't heard from her, so I don't, I don't know if she has COVID or not, but she was going to check for that. But that's why she's not here. Uh, and then I added Michael Brown, who uh, has been here a couple of times, I think, and, and so uh, he's a, a brother in Christ and has been having some health issues also. So Seems to be doing better though, so they let him out of the hospital today, right? right. Uh, but we still like to pray for him, Michael Brown, so hopefully he'll continue uh, to get better. So th those are the people uh, that I've added up there to the list. Uh, and then Jacqueline. Jacqueline is still with us. So uh, the surgeon called me uh, when they start. I think I've talked to her three times. And... Um, so anyway, she, the bottom line is she did really well, according to the surgeon anyway, that's what she told me. So she said Jacqueline did very, very well. She's still there in recovery, and um, but they apparently they got the bone chips out and they fixed her hip. So the doctor said, yep, so she's got a brand new hip. She's gonna be good with that. Um, and then so I asked the surgeon, because Jacqueline had said something about she's probably gonna be over there, have to stay over there for several weeks for rehab and therapy and which I think you have to do that when you get a new hip and they, you know, those kind of things. But the surgeon, I asked the surgeon about that and she just said, she, well, I'm not sure what the schedule will be. So I don't know how long she's going to be over there. Um, and I did, I texted her a while ago, but she hasn't answered yet, but she, she may be asleep. And, but according to the surgeon, she did really, really well. So we're very, we're very thankful for that. But please continue to pray for her. Uh, remember, on October 27th, the Central Congregation will be hosting the area-wide singing, so we want to support that uh, if we can. Uh, and then we're going to turn it over to Cheryl for a song, and then Brother Ralph, uh, I mean, sorry, Cheryl has our opening prayer, and then Bobby has our dismissal prayer. So, Brother Cheryl. Please get your song book and turn to number 496. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful in the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. We shall sing on that beautiful shore. The melodious song of the blessed, and our spirit shall sorrow no more. Not a sigh for the In the sweet by and by, 
together and exhort one another and study another lesson of thy word. Father, there are so many things that we, we, we can we should thank you for in each and every prayer, but we are so thankful that you bless us the way you do. Some more than others, but that's we all need to accept that as just part of life. Father, this morning or tonight, I pray for peace. I pray for health for the sick. And I pray for understanding among our brotherhood and, and a lot of a lot of our friends, neighbors, and everything. I pray that we can reach out to people and touch them and bring them into this church and other churches. Fill these pews and always, always small congregations. Fill them with your children, people that will be your children. So we all can ultimately end up in heaven with you. Father, I pray for all this. Now I pray for, as I started peace, there's so much going on and it seems to be getting worse. I pray that our country will not become involved in a conflict, but it looks like we already are. So I pray for the young men and ladies that are serving our country in harm's way. I pray for all of those in harm's way around this world. Well, I ask now that you guide us through another lesson of thy word and forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please put your markers at number 226 to be a song of invitation after the lesson. Turning to the book of Matthew, we are looking again at some verses there in Matthew chapter 24. And if anybody's interested, I forgot to give you an update on me. I forgot about that. Um, I went to the eye surgeon yesterday. So he said uh, he's very pleased with himself. So, uh, I am too. <laughs> he said, look at that work I did. That's beautiful right there. I tell you, man, that's beautiful what I did. Look at all that, you know. All looks like a jumbled mess to me, but he's very pleased with it. So he said that everything looks great or something could still go wrong. That's, that's always a possibility, but I think it's highly unlikely at this point. As long as, uh, you know, he told me to behave myself and, you know, don't overdo it and don't do crazy 
be things I don't need to be doing. And as long as I do that, he said, uh, should be good. And so I'm very thankful to God for that. I'm thankful for my surgeon that he had the, uh, was given the ability by God to do the amazing repair that, that he did. So uh, anyway, that's, that's what I found out yesterday. So it was, it was a good day. And then again, Jacqueline did very well in her surgery, so I thought it was, it was a good day all around, so we're thankful for that. All right, so we're talking about the, uh, the tribulation, and we've been looking at uh, why the Bible really doesn't teach this idea of a seven-year period of extreme suffering that will occur at the end of the world right before the judgment which is what the pre-millennialists teach. And so we looked at the idea of, uh, you know, where do they get this from? And so we've been looking at Matthew 24. We looked at Daniel chapter 9 uh, to get the number, you know, where do they get that seven years uh, from? Because you don't read that anywhere in the Bible about there will be a seven-year period of tribulation. So we looked at how they did the math uh, from Daniel chapter 9. Uh, and then so mainly we've been again looking at uh, Matthew chapter 24 where they, this is where you see the signs and as we said Jesus was actually answering two questions. One was about the destruction of Jerusalem and the other was about the end of the world. And so the two distinct questions, two distinct answers, the apostles all thought it was the same event but Jesus is showing them no, no, these are two disconnected events. One, the destruction of Jerusalem has nothing to do with the end of the world. And so a lot of people read this Matthew 24 and they, they kind of just lump it all in there together. But that's not what Jesus uh, was talking about. So we ended up last week, we looked at those verses uh, 17 through 20, where Jesus is telling his followers, he's telling the Christians what they needed to do. You know, when this, when this tribulation happens, you got to do something. So what kind of things was he telling them to do? Lead to the mountains. Yeah, head to the mountains. What else? What other advice did he give? When do you need to head to the mountains? As soon as you need to. Quick, right. Can I stop and make a bologna sandwich before I hit the road? Can I pack a suitcase? No, he was saying, man, when, when this happens, you need to immediately get out of Jerusalem and head for the mountains, okay? And so he told everybody, you know, don't wait, don't take time. And then he gave further, you know, he said, you need to hope that certain things are not true when this tribulation comes upon you, such as... Winter and... Yeah. South, South better hope it's not in the wintertime. You better hope it doesn't happen on Saturday, on the Sabbath day. What, what was so special about that? Gates are going to be closed, right? So the good news is that will keep the Romans out, at least temporarily, but the bad news would be for you Christians, you won't be able to get out. Romans can't get in, but you can't get out. And Jesus is basically saying, I assure you, they're going to get in before you get out. Sooner or later, the Romans are going to get in. So you need to get out before they get here. And if that happens on the Sabbath, you know, the, the city's going to be locked down tight, and you're not, they're not going to let you. Get out. What did, did he have anything to say about uh, mothers? Yes. What did he say about them? Them with, uh, with, with they and with young children that have no children. Yeah. Hope, you better hope that it doesn't happen when you're pregnant or, yes, you have very small, you know, you're nursing very small children. Um, so, again, if, if that's the return of Christ, what difference would it make? None. It doesn't matter whether you're with child or you're not with child. It doesn't matter if it's on Saturday. It doesn't matter if it's in January or July. None of those verses make any sense if Jesus is warning them about the end of the world. But it makes perfect sense if he's talking about the Romans laying siege to Jerusalem. And that's exactly what he's talking about. It's the only way that those verses make sense. So let's pick it up then with verse 21. So after all those instructions, you better hope this doesn't happen. The verse 21, 
For then shall be great tribulation, so there's the word, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no, nor ever shall be. Okay? So Jesus does, in fact, mention that term, tribulation. He says this will be a tribulation. Okay? But in the context, what he's talking about is what we read in verse 15. Right? When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Okay? And then we went back to Daniel chapter 9. We looked at that. Right? And so the tribulation in verse 21 is talking about the abomination of desolation in verse 15. Okay? Now, how do we know, again, thinking about the context of everything we've looked at here, how do we know that this tribulation, this desolation of abomination, how do we know it will not be at the end of time? Okay. For one thing, right, again, it would make no sense to, well, you got to do this, you got to, when the end of the world comes, what do we have to do? We won't have time to do anything, right? It's too late. Well, Lord, if you give me just a minute, let me, I won't have a minute, I won't have a second at that point. It, it's too late, it's over. Okay, so that's one thing, and is there anything else in this context that gave us a clue that this, he can't be talking about the end of time? Look at, if you're not, if you're not remembering, look at verse 34. So some, somebody tell me what that's saying there. What does Jesus mean there? Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. What does that mean? Still be alive. Yeah. Some of you people that are standing here listening to me right now, some of you, at least, will still be alive when this tribulation occurs. Well, this was 2,000 years ago. So, again, we got really old people, or Jesus was a liar. One of the, it's got to be one of the two, if that's talking about the end of the world. But if it's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, which was about roughly about 37 years in the future, would there still be people alive 37 years later? Yeah, certainly. Some, a lot of them would be dead, but a lot of them would still be alive, too. Okay? So, again, it makes perfect sense. And so we said that's the cutoff point. And then verse 35, now he starts talking about the end of the world. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Now he's moving to the end. The earth will disappear. Heaven, the heavens that God created will disappear. And all the following verses, you can tell he's clearly talking about the end of the world. But verse 34, he's talking about everything before it. So all these things will be fulfilled. Everything I just told you will be fulfilled while some of you are still breathing oxygen. Okay? So it can't be 2,000 years later. That's impossible. Or Jesus is a liar, one of the two. And we know which one it is. Okay? Now, going back to, again, verse 21, it says this will be great tribulation that nobody's seen since the beginning of the world nor ever shall be. And so some people look at that and say, well, was this, that would seem to indicate that the suffering here was, was the worst ever. And the point, again, Jesus is making is he's, he's trying to warn them about how horrible this is going to be. You can't imagine, none of you have ever experienced anything like this. And so that's why you need to heed my warning and when you see them approach, you need to get out. Okay? So some people will say, well, what about, what about something like the Holocaust? I mean, that would have been worse than this, right? So Jesus said, well, this is like the worst ever. Well, wouldn't the Holocaust be worse than this? No. Well, obviously, and I've studied the Holocaust a lot. I've spoken personally to a lot of Holocaust survivors. Uh, so I know something about it. Of course, there's people, plenty of people smarter than me that know more than I do. But yes, the Holocaust was a horrendous event. And if you go by raw numbers, there were more people killed in the Holocaust than there were in the siege of Jerusalem. Just raw numbers. You know, Hitler killed far more Jews than the Romans killed Jews in the destruction of Jerusalem. But 
here's something to consider. Again, what Jesus is really referencing here is the intensity of what they're going to see. So think about the things that Hitler did. <coughs> Does anybody know, and if you don't know, it's okay, because a lot of people probably wouldn't know, just history nerds, you know. But uh, how long was Hitler in power? About 15 years, right? How long? You're really close, yeah, about 12 years, 1933 to 1945. So the things that Hitler did, the millions of Jews he killed, was done over a 12-year period. What Jesus is talking about here, as, as we talked about last week, this was in 70 AD, and it took place from April until September. This all took place in six months. So Hitler took 12 years to do what he did. The Romans are going to do this in six months. So it's, again, it's more intense. It's compacted. And so Jesus is just trying to get them to understand this is going to be so horrendous you can't even imagine. It's why you don't want to be here. You need to listen to me. And you need to get out. Because the Jews are really going to suffer. They're going to pay for their disobedience. Okay? So how bad was it? Well, let's take a look at a first-hand account. Somebody who witnessed this. And that's what we have to go on, just like we do with the Holocaust, is what we read about in the history books, or again, if you're fortunate like I have been to interview and talk to, get to know some Holocaust survivors, that's where real history is. Because you find out from them what they saw. And it's stuff that nobody should ever see. Right? So something this far back, obviously there are no survivors 2,000 years later. So we, we have to go to the history books. Well, was there anybody there that spoke about it or wrote about it? And, and there were some people. Okay? And so the one we want to look at is somebody you might have heard of. I've mentioned him from the pulpit several times over the years. A man by the name of Josephus. Okay? And he was a, a Jewish historian, and he also kind of worked for the Romans. And so the Romans didn't really trust him that much because he was Jewish, and the Jews hated him because they saw him as a sellout. So he, he was kind of stuck in the middle. But he wrote a, a lot of history about the Jews and, and the things that happened at this point. And included in that was his description of the siege of Jerusalem. Uh, in AD 70. So just let me kind of highlight some of the things that he says. And I've, I've got his book in my office. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's an interesting read. It's a horrifying read, but it's, but just some of the things that he put in there. So in this six month period, uh, about 1.1 million Jews were killed by the Romans. So about a million, 100,000 Jews were killed in very horrible ways, as we'll see. About 97,000 of them will be turned into slaves. They will be forced to be slaves uh, to the Romans. Now, while the Romans laid siege, so yes, Jerusalem had the walls and they had the gates, but again, they couldn't get out. So there was nowhere to go for supplies. So the Romans who are surrounding the city uh, what can they do about getting supplies, namely food? Whatever they want. What about the people inside the city? They're going to run out. Okay. So think about, even if we talked about, okay, all the food that's in Etowah today and all the people that are in Etowah, if we got completely cut off from the outside world for six months, with that food that's already in this town, would it last us for six months? No. Not even remotely close to that. And it doesn't do them either. Okay, they run out of food fairly quickly. And so everybody was facing starvation. Okay, and so according to the record, the neighbors, the Jews themselves, I mean, Josephus basically said, you know, basically... <laughs> What the Jews did to each other was almost worse than what the Romans did to them. Because they turned on each other because it was every man for himself. I mean, that, that's what it, 
it came down to dog eat dog. In some cases, literally. So they would break into each other's houses. They stole food from each other. You know, I don't care that you don't have any. I want your food. If I'm bigger than you and stronger than you, I'm going to beat you up. I'm going to take your stuff. And that's, that's what happened. One of the most horrifying things that Josephus described was the fact that especially when, you know, not in the first week or two, but when it got really bad, and Jesus, of course, would have known this was going to happen. That's why I brought your attention to that prayer, not with child. Or... Mothers ate their own children. It wasn't one or two either. It was a lot. Because they were so hungry. So they would murder and kill and eat their own children. And, and you and I, of course, would stand here and go, oh, I, I would never do that. And I really, I, I believe that in my head. I, I would never do it, but I've never been that hungry. So I don't know. Right, I don't know. I, I'd like to think I'd never eat my own son, but I've never been that hungry. You know, these people were desperate. They became like animals. And we saw a little bit of this a few years ago. You guys remember Hurricane Katrina when that hit New Orleans? What was that, 2006 or seven? Or I remember George Bush was president. And it, it was horrifying. Those people turned into animals, killing each other, looting, you know, all the things that they were doing. And that was just from a hurricane. And I'm not minimizing the hurricane. I mean, the damage was horrific and a lot of people were killed. But you know with a hurricane, okay, I don't have any electricity today. I don't have a lot of food. But what do you know is coming? Some help is coming in a few days, right? So I might get hungry, but I know probably in a few days I'm going to get some food. You know? So even with that, they turned on each other so quickly knowing that relief was on the way. Well, the Jews knew there was no relief coming. Right? And so, I mean, we, we thought, well, we would never do that sort of thing. Oh, I, I saw that in New Orleans. It's amazing how quickly, and again, you and I would like to think that we wouldn't do that, but we've not really been like they were. You'd like to think you wouldn't turn into that, but it's amazing how quickly civilization disappears when people lose all their modern conveniences and it's just a survival mode. So this is what was going on. So, you know, mothers eating their own children. It's just hard to, to comprehend that. The wealthy Jews, and again, going back to remember, you know, Jesus warned about you can't worship God and mammon. You, you know, if you're so worried about material gain, if money is, is all that's important, well, then money is your God. Money has replaced the real God. And for some of these wealthy Jews, you would think they wouldn't care about their money. They'd just be trying to survive. And, but a lot of the wealthy Jews swallowed their gold. They ate their money. And it wasn't because they were hungry necessarily, although that would put something on your stomach, but you can't really digest that very well. But they would eat their gold, and then they defected to the Romans. Once the Romans came up, hey, I, I, I'm coming with you, I'm coming with you, you know, because the idea was they thought eventually the money's going to come out, and I'll still have it. Right? I can smuggle it out literally in my stomach or in my intestines. I'll smuggle out. That way I'll still have my money. And if I surrender the Romans, I can survive it. I'll, I'll still be rich. I, I guess that's what they were thinking. So they were hoping to escape with their wealth. Well, that plan didn't go too well. Okay, Because obviously enough people saw them do that. That again, I was said they kind of turned on each other. So, hey, these guys are. So the Romans found out that, oh, these all these people that are defecting to you, their bellies are full of gold. So 
So you know what the Romans did? Yeah, cut them open. You don't need that gold. I want it. If it's in your stomach, I'm going to cut you. I'm going to gut you like a fish to get that money out of there. And that's exactly what they did. I can't, I, and I, I can't imagine, and I don't want to imagine what that scene must have looked like. And this went on a lot. It wasn't just like a one-time thing. This was going on a lot. And so they would rip their stomachs open looking for the coins. Uh, Josephus recorded that at least uh, the, at least one night they counted and 2,000 people died that way in one night. 2,000 people had themselves ripped open as the Romans were looking for money. And so what that meant, of course, is that a lot of Jews that the Romans came upon, whether they were rich or not, guess what happened? Romans had cut them open looking for what? Well, this guy might have money. Let's find out. So there'd be other Jews that probably didn't. They didn't have any money. They didn't have anything in their stomach, but it didn't matter. It's not going to save them, right? You think the Romans are going to, if you said, hey, it's not me. I don't have money in my stomach. The Romans are going to go, okay, we take your word for it. You know, you know that's not going to happen. Well, let's just find out. And, of course, they're not going to sew them back up. You don't recover from that. So that would be a horrifying way to die. But so he recorded at least 2,000 died that, one, that way just in one night of the Romans looking for this money. Uh, many of the Jews, thousands of Jews, were beaten by Roman soldiers. Once they got in there, they were tortured in all kinds of anything that you could imagine. I'm not going to describe all that, but if you could imagine it, the Romans imagined it too. And so they found all kinds of interesting ways to kill people. And that's similar to what the Nazis did in the Holocaust. That's one of the most horrifying things about the Holocaust. It wasn't just that the Nazis killed people, but it's how they did it. Finding so many creative ways to kill people. Like it was a game. They enjoyed it. And so did the Romans. And I, I don't know, I really don't know if Hitler knew anything about the siege of Jerusalem, if he got some ideas from that. I, he may have, but there were some similarities to some of the conduct. But so a lot of them were beaten, they were tortured. Thousands of Jews were crucified by the Romans. And we talked about, you know, when Jesus was crucified, um, who did they, who did the Romans reserve that method of execution for? The worst criminals, right? And they didn't kill everybody by crucifixion because as I said at that time, crucifixion was just about the worst way you could kill somebody. Uh, so here we have, you know, 37 and some odd years later, after they crucified Jesus, they're going to crucify thousands of other Jews. Uh, and they did this, and it was recorded that, you know, that to them, to the Romans, this was a big joke. Right? So they did it to amuse themselves. You know, yeah, I could just stab this guy with a sword and be done with it, but where's the fun in that? Let, let's enjoy this. Let's make them suffer. Let's make this thing drag out. And so they would crucify them as a joke until, according to Josephus, all the wood in the city was gone. I mean, it had been used to make crosses. Every bit of wood they could find, they made crosses and then they crucified people. Okay, and as we said, with Jesus, how long did it take? How long was he up on the cross? Six hours. Six hours. Six hours, from about 9 a.m. to about 3 p.m. Six hours. But I told you at the time when we studied the crucifixion of Jesus, there are some people that lasted for days. Just depended on the severity of the scourging. And, you know. So this was a way to torture, you know, give the Jews a very slow, painful, it wasn't a quick, merciful death by any means. Thousands of them done that way. By actual count, and there were times, and I don't know why, that sometimes the Romans would count, and other times they didn't fool with it, but by actual count, 115,880 bodies were carried through one single gate within a three-month period, just carrying the dead bodies out of the city. 600,000, all told, were carried out that way during this siege. 
600,000, okay, in, in six months. So by comparison, in the American Civil War, 1861 to 1865, there were about 600,000 Union and Confederate soldiers killed in four years. They didn't only kill 600,000, that's just the ones they drug out the gate, but in, in just a few months as opposed to four years of carnage. So again, this was an intense, concentrated effort. When they got, there just got to be too many bodies to kill, because the Romans started that, and they, they were carrying all the bodies out, so yeah, they got up to about 600,000 and they were just like, you know what, this is, we're tired of doing this. So they just started storing the dead bodies inside Jerusalem in the houses. And they would just pile dead bodies. Okay? Again, the Nazis did the same thing in the 1940s. So they would pile the bodies into, into these large houses. Now they took thousands of prisoners and we've all heard about uh, the gladiator games, you know? And so they took thousands of prisoners who were forced either to fight animals, and I mean lions and tigers, you know, vicious animals, or they were forced to fight each other in the gladiator games for the amusement of the Romans. So some of them, quite a few of them died uh, that way. Now, Jerusalem, of course, will be overthrown at the end of this six-month period in September of 70 AD. The temple was completely destroyed. Just like, remember, I call your attention to look at Matthew 24 and look at verse 2. Where, you know, in verse 1, the apostles, hey, gee, look, Lord, look at this great temple that's here. And Jesus said to them, See not all these things, verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And I, I think I told y'all in the Wednesday night uh, class at, at some point, or maybe it was Sunday morning, at some point we talked about this, but just recently they've made some more archaeological discoveries of the, the temple in Jerusalem. And there were, you know, it was made out of these huge kind of like rectangular, almost like a brick, but massive, you know, weighing several tons each, and they were stacked on top of each other. Well, they made some more recently discovery, uh, discoveries here in the last couple of years, and so far, all of those stones that they found, that every one of them have been taken off the others. There's not, they haven't found two that are still stacked together. And what did Jesus say? You're not going to find one stone stacked on top of the other. So far, that's what we found. Just like he said. When, they, when the Romans dismantle that temple, they're going to dismantle that temple. They will completely destroy it. Okay? They, could, they would have probably burned it down, but it was made out of stones. So they couldn't do that. So what they did was they took all the stones. and That took a lot of work because, again, the, these things weighed several tons each. Uh, but that's what Marvin archaeology has simply confirmed what Jesus said there in Matthew 24 uh, and verse 2. Now, I want to show you this direct quote from Josephus. This I took out of the book. And it, uh, again, it's very it's horrifying. It's interesting reading, but it's very horrifying. But notice, and I'll read it just in case you guys in the back can't see it. But I don't think because it's there's a lot, so you probably can't read it, but I'll read it. Again, a direct quote from Josephus who saw this. They, being the Romans, they slew whomsoever they found without distinction and burned the houses and all the people who had fled into them. And when they entered for the sake of plunder, they found whole families of dead persons and houses full of carcasses destroyed by famine, then they came out with their hands empty. And though they thus pitied the dead, they had not the same emotion for the living, but killed all they met, whereby they filled the lanes with dead bodies. Now think about this. The whole city ran with blood. Insomuch that many things which were burning were extinguished by the blood. Could you imagine? Something's on fire and there's so much blood that it's like water and it puts out the fire. 
That's a lot of blood. Similar on a smaller scale was the, the uh, French Revolution, which began in 1789. And that, of course, they were famous for the guillotine and they would chop people's heads off. And there were similar accounts there that the streets of Paris had said literally it was like a river of blood. And they couldn't, they couldn't get the, the blood cleaned up. They had to wait for it to rain. And then they said you just the streets smelled like blood. You couldn't get the smell out of the streets. So it would have been something like this. But this is Josephus' description of this. Horrifying to think about what these people went through. And so that's what Jesus called the abomination of desolation. And then he also called it the tribulation. But it's one particular tribulation that he was talking about. All right, so we need to stop there. Any questions or comments? Mark, yes. Intense hatred, isn't it? What? Intense hatred. Yeah, I mean, you. it's hard to relate to it. I mean, I've been mad at people before, but I've never hated anybody like that. And I thank God that I've never had a hatred that deep that, yeah, you could rip open somebody's belly, you could crucify them for laughs, and, you know, I, and again, when I studied the Holocaust and, and talked to these survivors, and they would tell me, yeah, the guards did this. And like, Why? Why? And nobody, of course, has a good answer to that. I, you know, why, how could any human being do that to another human being, to treat them like that? I understand some people get in a rage, but usually that's because something's been done to you, right? Maybe somebody breaks into your house and they kill your family and you want to get even. You can sort of understand that, right? But just wholesale slaughter of people you've never even met and then I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill them that way and laugh about it. You know, a lot, a lot of accounts of the Nazis, they would laugh and joke and they would make bets. They'd put them in the gas chamber and there were windows, you know, and they're not, they would make bets. 20 bucks says that guy over there dies first. No, no, no. 50 bucks says she dies first. I mean, it was a game to them. I, I can't imagine it, Jesse. I mean, I've never hated anybody like that. So just, yeah, pure, pure evil is another way to describe it. Um, but that's, that's what the Jews are going to go through during this tribulation. So, all right, any other questions or comments? would, turn in your Bibles to the book that's speaking of Romans. Let's turn over to Romans. and look there in a few minutes. But I don't have any milk or cookies for you tonight, but I'm going to tell you a story. And I didn't write this story, so I want to give credit to uh, a lady by the name of Catherine Hannon. Uh, came up with the main idea for this. I changed a few things, but it's basically the same story. So it's her story. I'd like to take credit for it, but I'm not clever enough to think of some of this. But it's, it's just a wonderful illustration about when we think about the character of God. And that's what we want to look at. So I'm going to tell you this story. So there's a little girl named Rebecca. She's about 10 or 12 years old. And she's sitting in her bedroom one day. And she, there's, it's a beautiful day outside. And she's watching uh, these other children who are out there playing and just, you know, doing what kids do and having a great time and it's a wonderful day and, and Rebecca's thinking, man, I want to I go out and play with them. They're having so much fun. But she remembered what her father had told her that morning before he left for work. And he had told her, he said, now Rebecca, you can't go outside and play today. You got to stay in the house. Do not go outside and play today. So, and she, of course, had asked him, like any of us, well, why not? You know, that's what kids do. Why not? Why, why can't I go out and play with the other kids? And her dad said, Rebecca, I, I just want you to trust me. Okay, I want you to trust me. It's not what's best for you today. Don't go out and play with the other kids. Uh, some other day, I'll let you do it, but not today. It's not the best thing for you. Just trust me. Okay. So 
He kisses her by, he gets in the car. So she goes back to her room and she's, she's reading a book. She's trying to get her mind off the kid, you know, but you can hear the other kids laughing and, you know, making all this noise. And it's, she looks out the window and, oh, it's just so beautiful. And <coughs> the sun was shining, you know, and they were having so much fun. And she's thinking, wow. Why won't he let me go out and play? It's not fair. I don't, I don't understand. Why should I have to miss out on all this fun? All my friends are out there. So she watched for a while and bless her little heart. And she tried to resist it. She did. But eventually she caved in. So she puts the book down and she runs outside. So she's playing for, she's playing with all the other kids. Well, she tried to tell herself while she's out there, and they're, you know, playing hopscotch and doing all these things, and she's trying to convince herself what a great time she's had. Oh, this is fun, and you know, blah, blah, blah. But the whole time, her heart felt uncomfortable because she, she felt guilty because she knew her dad had told her not to go out. She wasn't supposed to be out there. So she was having fun on the one hand, but the other hand, not as much fun as she could have been having because she was having these feelings of guilt. She kept looking around, make sure dad's not coming home. If he sees me out here, he's going to kill me. You know, so she can't really fully enjoy herself like she thought she would. And after she plays for a few hours, she tells her friends, okay, I got to go. I got to get back in the house. And she's thinking, I'll, I'll go back in before dad gets home from work. And Hey, nobody will ever know, right? So in her haste, she's running into the house, and she goes in through the garage, and there's a garden hose, and she gets her foot caught in it, and she trips, and she falls onto the concrete. While she's falling, trying to stop herself from falling, she grabs, you know, there's a rake in there. Dad's got tools in there. Grabs a rake, and pulls it down, and she goes down, and the rake hits her daddy's prized possession, his Corvette, that just, he had just finished a brand new paint job. And, of course, she hits it with the rake, and it puts a little dent in it. It scratches the paint off. She bangs up her knee. She cuts it. She's bleeding a little bit. Bruised really bad. It's really hurting. So she's injured herself. She's damaged the car. Of course, her mind is racing. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? You know, she's very upset about all this. So she limps on into the house. She goes to her room. And she's thinking, of course, about the car, she's thinking about how bad her knee hurts. And she remembers all the times that she had fallen and her dad had taken good care, you know, he had fixed her boo-boo, you know, and had always done that and always made her feel better. But she thought, not this time. After what I've done, how, how can I face it? I have disobeyed him. I have damaged his beautiful Corvette that he just painted. And I've wrecked his paint job. And so she's biting her lips. She's crying a little bit, but she's trying not to cry too loud because she doesn't want to cause any attention. So for the rest of the afternoon, she lays on her bed and she's really hurting. I mean, she's damaged her knee. She's really hurting, but she doesn't dare to go out of the room. And so her body's aching, but also her heart is aching because she knows what she's done. And so she felt like, and you know what goes through children's minds, she felt like her father, well, daddy's not going to love me after this. I disobeyed him. I wrecked his car. I mean, he's, he's not going to love me after this. And that's what hurt worse than anything. She hurt, The knee was throbbing, but she, she, she had heartache. Because she thought, he's, he's not going to love me. He's, he's going to be so mad. And, and I, she knew she messed up before, but she thought, man, this time I've just, I've gone too far. I've just, I've gone too far. So she had a nanny. And so the nanny comes in looking for her because she hadn't seen her in a while. And 
the nanny comes in and what happened? You know, so Rebecca just sobs and tells her the whole story. Tells her what she did. And, you know, I, I can't face it now. I can't, what am I going to tell him? I can't, I can't do that. He's not going to love me, you know. And so she, the nanny says, trying to comfort her, she said, look, what you did was wrong. You, you have messed up. You're right. You disobeyed your father. You messed up the car. But you can't continue in your wrongness by sitting here. That's just going to make it worse. You need to go to your father and tell him. Just tell him what you did. But he won't love me anymore. She said, you just, you just go tell him what you did. Trust me, it'll, it'll work. And Rebecca's crying, you know, it, it won't. I'm not worthy of his love anymore. The nanny says, you know something? You were no more worthy of your father's love yesterday than you are right now. But you had it anyway. You had it anyway. Your father loves you because you're his daughter. It's not because of anything you do or what you fail to do. He loves you because you're his daughter. And that hasn't changed. You messed up. You made a mistake. But that hasn't changed. You need to go talk to him. Just tell him. Hasn't he told you every day since you were really little? Hasn't he told you how much he loves you? So do you doubt his word? Do you not believe that your father loves you? He's he tells you that every day. Do you doubt him? And she never had it, and she, she never really thought about it that way. And the nanny said, do you think his love for you, do you think it's dependent on you? On what you do or you fail to do? Or you think that love is always there? Because he tells you it is. So Rebecca started thinking about, well, I, I didn't really think that I was doubting his word, but maybe I am, you know. And so she decided that the nanny was right. Yeah, I need to, I need to go, I just need to go fess up. I need to tell him what I did. So she goes downstairs because she figures, well, he's got to be home from work by now. And so she goes downstairs. And, of course, we, a lot of us have probably been there. If not, every one of us have been there. You know, you messed up. you got to confront your parents if you're trembling. And, you know, you, you don't know what's going to happen, how it's going to go. You're pretty sure it's going to be bad. But so you, you have that fear that she was. And so she limps kind of into the living room. And her dad is sitting there in his favorite chair. And, you know, he looked up when she comes into the room and he smiles at her, you know. And so he tells her that, uh, he said, oh, you, you finally came down to see me. I'm so glad to see you. Why don't you come here and hop in my lap? It's good to see you, you know, just like he normally did. And of course for her, that was the last straw. And so, she breaks down. Oh, you, Dad, you don't you don't understand. You, you you just don't know how wicked I've been. You don't know how evil I've been. You don't, you don't know what I did. And I know you can't love me anymore because I disobeyed you and I went outside and I played and I and I fell and I hit your car and I messed it up. I mean, she blurts out the whole thing. There's no way that you you say you love me, but you didn't know this. There's no way you can love me. Father looks at her and says, I know all about it, Rebecca. I watched you go outside. I watched you fall. I watched you hit the car. I saw the whole thing. And of course the kids, you did. But 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 weren't you at work? I thought you were at work. Well, her father shook his head. He said, no. I took the day off today to spend it with you. 
I wanted some special time with you. And so that's why I told you, not, not today. Don't go outside and play today. I just was going to be gone for a few minutes and I was going to come back. And we were going to spend the day together and have fun together. And that's why I didn't want you going off with your friends. And so ever since I saw you fall, she said, I, he said, I've been waiting, wanting you just to come to me and tell me. Because he said, really, what I want to do, I just want to bandage your knee. I just want to help you. I want to take care of you. He didn't yell at her. He didn't scream at her. He didn't. My mom probably would have. <laughs> but he did. So I just, I just wanted to hear it from you. And I, want to, I just want to help you. I know you're hurt, and I want to take care of you. So he said, it's really hard for me to sit here knowing how bad you were hurting, but I wanted you to come to me. And I felt like you would sooner or later, but I was hoping. So he said, just come to me and let me help you. So all of this is running through her head, right? So she, she can't even believe her ears. And so she's thinking, my father took the day off from work. He had planned to spend the whole day with me. And I missed it. I messed it up because, you know, I was selfish and I did. Because she would have rather spent the shit fun with the other kids, but she didn't get a lot of quality time with her father. And she would have liked to have spent it with him. And there it was, and she, she blew it. And so she realized how foolish she had been. And yet, at the same time, her father knew it all along, and yet he still loved her anyway. She said, but Father, how, how can you possibly love me now after, after all this? Well, he smiled at her and told her something. Even as an adult, she never forgot. He said, Rebecca, dear, I loved you before you were born. You're my daughter, and I will always love you. Although sometimes your actions will result in consequences that you could have avoided, nothing can ever separate you from my love. Now you need to come to me and let me help you with those bruises. So look at Romans chapter 8. Let's begin in verse 35. We close out. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. That's a great story. I wish I had written it, but that's a great story. And it makes this point. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, there's that word again, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. There's nothing you or I can do that will separate us from God's love. We can separate ourselves from him by not obeying him, but nothing will change the fact that God loves us. Everybody that will be lost in the end, God loves every single one of them. They won't be lost because God doesn't love them. They'll be lost because they disobeyed and then they refused to repent. So this is something that should encourage us that knowing that, like this little girl, she said, I, I'm not worthy of your love. Well, I, I feel the same way. I'm not worthy of God's love. I have done nothing to earn his love. But the awesome thing is I don't have to do anything to earn his love. He just gives it to me. That's part of his grace. And if I really let myself think about it, it overwhelms me. Because we're like that little girl, right? We are God's little children. That's what we are to him. No matter how old we are, no matter how long we've lived, we are his children. And so it's comforting to know that nothing can separate me from God's love. And because God loved me, he sent his son to die for me, to bleed for me, on that cross.
cross at Calvary and to do the same thing for you. So tonight, if you're not a Christian, you need to become one. You need to, to take advantage of the love of God. And even if you don't obey, God's still going to love you anyway. But like the Father said in the story, there are consequences. But it's never a consequence that I'm going to lose God's love, and neither are you. But this girl was so disappointed because, because she knew, I mean, she was devastated because she disappointed her father. We need to have that same attitude with our heavenly when we disappoint him, it ought to hurt us because he loves me so much. I don't want to disappoint him, but I know that I often do. So if you have a need to become a Christian tonight or if you have a need to be restored because you've, you've fallen away, you have a loving father who's begging you, pleading you to come to him. And let him take care of your wounds, just like this father and this little girl. So if you have a need, please come forward as together we stand and we sing. Have mine affliction been nailed to the cross? Is thy heart right with God? Dost thou count all things for Jesus but lost? Is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson flood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. Hast thou dominion or self and or sin? Is thy heart right with God? Over all evil without and within, is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson flood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. Are all thy powers under Jesus' control? Is thy heart right with God? Does he each moment abide in thy soul? Is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson flood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. Thank you all for being here tonight. So good to see you. Hope you'll be back on Sunday. We thank Mark again for another good lesson tonight. We all need to be thankful that we have him to listen to all the time. Oh, I lost my page. Excuse me. Uh, please remember, always keep it on the sick in our prayers. Yeah, we all need to do that. Remember Jackson. Keep her in your prayers. There are others. We, we all know we, we have a lot that we need to keep praying for them for their health. Uh, remember services. So next Sunday morning, Bible study at 9.30, regular services, 10.30. Sunday night, 6 o'clock. Back here next Wednesday night, 6 o'clock. Be here if you can. Bring somebody with you if you can. Remember, God loves you. Jesus died for you. The least we can do is try to do a little something back. Please turn to number 25. Let's sing the first verse of this and we'll have a closing prayer. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below, anywhere without him, dearest joys would fade. Anywhere with Jesus, I am not afraid. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go.
We pray that each one would be greatly blessed. We pray for all those who are sick, that they would be made well soon. We pray for Sister Jacqueline, that she will have a fast recovery and she will be back pretty soon. And so will all the other who are sick. We also pray for all the victims of these two hurricanes that came just back to back and did so much damage to so many states, cities. We especially pray for all the victims who have lost everything. And some who have lost their lives. We pray that you would grant these cities that did the, that were damaged so bad that they'll be able to grow, uh, to build back, and will be a, a happy city in the in the future. We also pray that you would be with the defenders of our freedom, especially those who are in harm's way. We pray that you would help them to do their job, do their duty, and to be able to come home to their families and loved ones. All this we ask in Jesus' precious name.